In, in 2008, uh, Professor Tim Lenton and his colleagues wrote a seminal paper called Tipping Elements in the Earth's Climate System. And it's worth reading, very, very scientific, but well worth reading. Most of us have heard about tipping points, but tipping elements were the things that uh, Lenton was watching and seeing what would actually happen. So think of a tipping element as, um, for example, a wheat belt in Western Australia, which goes from a productive wheat belt to suddenly a saline countryside, and it doesn't go back. Or an ice sheet that melts and doesn't reform. Something's tipped across, a threshold is being crossed, and it's not going to go back again. So tipping elements are very, very important. Do you care? And does it matter? That, to me, is one of the really important things. Do you care, and does it matter? Now, in the process of identifying the, the tipping elements in the Earth's climate system, Lenton and his colleagues looked globally and at a continental scale. They were looking at things like the melting of the Arctic uh, ice sheet in summertime. They were looking at uh, changes in Greenland. They were looking at things like the, uh, the El Nino. Uh, what was going to change, and, and over what sort of time scale? And they brought in three important criteria. One was the political time frame, the political time horizon. The horizon in which, if a decision were made, it actually would affect the future. They also came up with an ethical time horizon, whereby you might care about it, but decisions that were made today, it wouldn't be done on those thinkings, not at all. And then the observation that a sufficient number of people have to care if you want to change something. They absolutely have to cheer. Otherwise, they're not worried about the consequences. They don't do anything. They just continue on as they were. So let's think about time horizons for a moment. 10,000 years ago, civilization as we know it was really just starting. 1,000 years ago, people in chain mail were crossing the English Channel invading Britain. 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago, my grandparents were born in Western Australia. They saw the rise of the motor car, they saw aeroplanes, they saw vaccines, uh, they saw the men on the moon. They lived through great changes. They saw the Great Depression, they saw two world wars, they saw the post-Second World War boom that came on. They saw huge amounts of change. And I have their direct oral history from talking to them. In about 100 years, probably, my children will have passed away. Medical science might have changed things, but probably they will have passed away. And they will have my oral history, what I will have passed on to them. So I would put it to you that 200 years straddling your birth date is roughly what matters to us all. We do think longer, of course we do, but around about 200 years. There are some people, of course, who go down famously in history books and indeed infamously in history books. But what about us? What time horizon matters to you? What time horizon matters to me? Is it a political time horizon? An ethical time horizon? Does a thousand years into the future matter to you? A hundred? Fifty? What really matters to you? We can all think about the long future and what matters to us dearly. And that really, to some extent, is our ethical construct. So to some of you, it might be the social issues of the day and what's actually happening to our society. That might be the thing that's most dear to you. Or it might be the problems we have in the environment, the extinctions that are actually occurring. You know, that might be the thing that matters. Or it could be the state of the economy in your country. Um, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? All of these things are quite legitimate. The thing is, when we look ahead at the far horizon, we tend to um, inflate our hopes and discount our fears. We all have the luxury of thinking in an ethical horizon, but we actually have the imperative to act in a political time horizon. And these are my two little boys, three and a half and one and a half. Now, in 1972, there was a report published called Limits to Growth. Again, some of you may have heard of it, but it's a very, very important paper. And it signaled that with the population growth, the consumption growth going on with the planet, with everything going on, there was quite a possibility that we would outstrip the, the, uh, the Earth's resources being able to provide what we needed. And we could go to a position of what was known as overshoot and collapse. Forty years on, 
even with amazing changes in technology, absolutely amazing changes in technology, the relationship still remains true. And we may well be heading towards a situation of overshoot and collapse. Now, Jürgen Randers, one of the uh, authors of that paper, who I know very, very well, in 2008 wrote a paper which was called Global Collapse, Fact or Fiction. And I'm going to read you his, what I describe as chilling conclusions. The phenomenon of overshoot and collapse and the possibility of global collapse is still relevant and worthy of study. Global collapse triggered by ever-growing emissions of greenhouse gases is still conceivable in the first half of the 21st century because of the unfortunate combination of global decision delays and self-reinforcing feedback in the climate system. Interestingly, it may prove very difficult to verify that global collapse in fact did take place, even if it did, and even after the fact. Global collapse defined as a situation where more than a billion people lose roughly half of what they hold dear in 20 years may well be hidden in the headlines, hidden from the headlines, and in the history books. The century that we're in right now is more likely to be described as a period of intense local strife, institutional breakdown, regionalization, and general malaise. The root cause, humanity overstepping an environmental limit, may well be lost in the clutter of historical detail. Global collapse could remain fiction, even if it proved to be fact. So you listen to these words again. The unfortunate combination of global decision delays and self-reinforcing feedback in the climate system. Do we stand idly by and just watch a Greek tragedy unfold? Or do we do something, each in our own way? Probably because Jane's here, I'm now going to read something from Shakespeare. <laughs> which is odd for an engineer. Uh, I'm going to read you uh, part of Act 2, Scene 7 of Shakespeare's As You Like It. And forgive the acting, it's not too flash. But, but I'll look on your blog later. <laughs> all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, the acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in his nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwilling to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape on lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon. With spectacles on nose, pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, well too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. And the last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion Son's teeth, son's eyes, son's taste, son's everything. Or as Bill Cosby put it, the seven ages of a man, preschooler, Pepsi generation, baby boomer, midlifer, empty nester, senior citizen, and organ donor. <laughs> 400 years ago, Shakespeare talked about the features of mankind entering and exiting life. And if I had to guess the time horizons of these seven ages, there'd be something like this. The child would be the next birthday, the adolescent the next party, the young adult the next vacation, the parent the next school term or bill, the empty nester the next experience, the mature adult the next generation, and the frail the next breath. By and large, we live for the here and now, and we have been doing so for millennia. We, the here and now is much, much more relevant to us than the when and if. And in the past, only a very few have had the fortune or foresight to look into the future and what it might bring, and then act as stewards in the present for those who follow. <coughs> but do you care? 
In 2005, I was honoured to be asked to deliver the Hawke Lecture and, and did so with a talk entitled A Sustainable Planet, A Future for Australia. It was a 45 minute lecture and I'm going to try and summarise it in about five minutes. And, but I will update it obviously and paraphrase it and read some parts of it. But I started, globally we have reached a point where every moment we fail to address our ever expanding ecological footprint, we set in train the impossibility for our children and grandchildren to experience the richness of life that we have been so lucky to enjoy. By assessing the health of the Earth's life support systems today, we can start to paint a picture of what to expect in the future. Freshwater resources are likely to become scarcer, rising temperatures uh, are likely to cause waves of extinctions, and the ecosystems that support life on Earth become ever more stressed. The way we are going is wrong. We are heading into a progress trap, a dead end. And I talked about three ways in which I believed the future could play out. One was destructive, one was impoverished, and the final one was a possible way of going forward. Now my shorthand for them was the carcass, the zoo, and a sustainability revolution. In the carcass I described a world where through our own short-sightedness we just let things rip. It didn't matter. We buried our heads in the sand, we ignored the ever-increasing warning signs, we did little to mitigate the problems that were building up. We applied band-aid solutions to events along the way and we didn't invest in ad adaptation and mitigation. And our attitude towards others in a less fortunate position was to pull up the drawbridge and just puff ourselves up. We have the choice whether we caught a potentially brutal way of life in which tens of millions of people are displaced, great cities collapse and waves of extinction wipe out whole species. We could perfect the art of short-sighted decision-making if we want this model. The future world I described could see humanity tearing itself apart like wolves around a carcass as the strong exploit the weak or weakening. The zoo was a tongue-in-cheek scenario in which we keep only the most appealing and economically important uh, creatures and parts of nature for us and we leave the rest out to dry as it were. We could triage the planet and make sure that only the wealthy and powerful feel that they are secure. We could build theme parks and zoos and capture everything on digital images so that those who are nostalgic can remember what we have lost. And the second scenario sees us exploiting the world and the world's natural resources to and beyond their limits to the point where everything is the built environment. Nothing is untouched. We care little about nature and when we do see it, we see it in zoos and in 3D in a cinema near you. You can't affect the past but you can affect the future. These were and are quite dark pictures of the future and ones that are quite possible and just hoping that they'll go away doesn't help. Hope, action and ingenuity saw us develop large cities in great tracts of land and hope, action and ingenuity gave, rice, uh, gave wealth for those in the present. But hope by itself means we stick to the same old ways and hold fast to the same old laws as long as the results are good in the present. Hope is what we have when we don't like the clouds on the horizon. We hope the forecast is wrong. We hope there is a silver lining. Hope is what makes us strive for the opportunity. But hope is also our excuse for inaction. This is not simply a time for hoping. This is a time for action. We have to choose. We have to get off our collective bums. We have to pull our heads out of the sand. We recognize the increasing rates of change for what they are. And we do something. We must plan, act, and try to slow down the rates of change. We must plan and build for changes that are already locked in. We must work to understand tipping elements and the thresholds that we must not pass, lest we flip into an unbearable stable state from which there is no return. I'm going to finish this talk in the same way that I did with the Hawke Lecture. We have just enough time to take on a monumental shift in the way we go, and go about our business. And believe me, it is not as usual. We deliberately go about building resilience in our societies. We go about, uh, with deliberation, building resilience in the economy. And we start a revolution in our economy. Each one of us needs to have a vision of a sustainable world, one in which we have in common, and one which we demand of business. We have in our choices the power to change. 
Each and every one of you has a pathfinder within. Create your own vision of a sustainable world. And with hope, action and ingenuity, you will create the future. The responsibility that befalls our generation, the card that's been dealt to us, is to turn the corner, to move away from an ethos that has seen us mine the planet to pay for the present, and to move towards a place where we are trying to secure a sustainable future, allowing humans to live in harmony with nature and with each other. So as you go from here tonight, I want you to be angry and excited. But above all, I want you to lead through your own actions and be demanding of political and business leadership. Tread lightly on the earth, build resilience in nature, and start a sustainability revolution. And that will come up. Thank you.